One of the issues about journalism that I think is elusive but that is so important is what is supposed to be the function of journalism. We often talk about bad reporting or bad journalists or bad stories, but you have to go to the first principle of what journalism is supposed to be, of the reason there was supposed to be a free press in the first place, of why the American founders at the founding of the Republic decided that part of the Bill of Rights ought to be a guarantee not just of free speech and the free exercise of religion, but also a free press. There was a reason for that. And the reason was very clear, which if you read the Federalist Papers, if you look at the debates at that time, if you look at how the citizens of the colonies and in the American Republic used the printing press, the value of it was that it was a means of holding powerful institutions accountable. It was one of the ways that they communicated with one another about the abuses of the British king. The printing press was then used as a way of debating what the founding principles of the republic should be about why there should be a federal republic in the first place. And they understood that it was very important that that press, the ability and the right to use the press be free, not just for the sake of it, but because of the importance in holding powerful institutions accountable in being able, when someone with a great deal of power stands up and makes a claim or an institution makes a claim, to be able to counter it, to disagree with it, to expose it as deceitful, to be able to warn people about the abuses of those who wield power. The idea of a printing press was not that you were supposed to be able to expose the secrets of your neighbor who was just an ordinary citizen. It wasn't the purpose of the printing press. It might inform people if you go and tell everybody about the dating life of your neighbor. We just looked at an article in New York Magazine that was about the very popular podcaster Andrew Huberman and criticized it heavily, not because it was necessarily false, but just because it didn't expose any wrongdoing by anybody in power. It was about Andrew Huberman's dating life. So even though it might have been factually true, and I'm not even saying it was, let's just assume hypothetically it was, it was still a pathetic report because it didn't in any way hold anyone powerful accountable. Andrew Huberman is a legitimate topic of journalistic inquiry because of the influence he wields, but it just didn't reveal anything in the public interest. Usually that's the purpose of journalism. So The Atlantic is a political magazine that is one of the most well-funded political magazines in the country because it's owned now by Steve Jobs' widow, Lorraine, uh, uh, pa Jobs, pa Lorraine Powell Jobs, who needless to say is an extremely wealthy woman, a multi-billionaire. She was the inheritor of Steve Jobs' Apple fortune. And it is a very old magazine. The Atlantic is a very well-known media brand. It has fallen into disrepute for a lot of different reasons. It has become just yet another liberal political outlet. It was ground zero for all of the most insane Russiagate fanaticism. It's led by Jeffrey Goldberg, who, as we've reported many times before, is probably the reporter who did the most to deceive the American public about the Iraq war. When he was at The New Yorker, he wrote stories that won National Magazine Awards and other top journalism awards for telling the public that Saddam Hussein was in an alliance with Al Qaeda and helping convince Americans that Saddam Hussein had participated in the 9-11 attack. But he has advanced and ascended as a result of those lies to run the Atlantic. And in addition to being a fanatical supporter of the Iraq war, Jeffrey Goldberg is also arguably the most fanatical supporter of Israel in all of the American mainstream media. I would probably put him right next to Ben Shapiro in terms of pro-Israel fanaticism. And in fact, Jeffrey Goldberg, though he's an American citizen, actually fought in the Israeli Defense Forces, or at least joined the Israeli Defense Forces and served as a prison guard in a prison that held Palestinians in Israeli prisons. That's how devoted he is to that foreign country. He actually joined its army, its military. And now Jeffrey Goldberg is the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, and over the weekend they published an article that was entitled, quote, The War at Stanford. And the subheadline was, I didn't know that college would be a factory of unreason. And the topic of this article, or one of the subjects or targets of this article, is not the institution of Stanford University, which would be a legitimate 
subject of journalistic scrutiny. Stanford University is certainly a powerful institution. And it did talk in some aspects about Stanford as an institution, but one of its main focus, uh, focuses was the political views of the classmates of the 19-year-old Stanford student who Jeffrey Goldberg got to write this article. Now, that person, the person who, and I want to be respectful of their pronouns, which is he, they, not to be honest, entirely sure how one uses those pronouns, he, they. Um, but the person's name is Theo Baker. And Theo Baker is a 19-year-old student at Stanford University. And you may wonder, how is it that a 19-year-old student at Stanford ended up being able to write a major article in a magazine as well-financed and as mainstream and as well-known as The Atlantic? And the reason is, is that Theo Baker is basically the classic Nepo baby when it comes to American journalism. Theo Baker's father is Peter Baker. And Peter Baker is the bureau chief, the Washington bureau chief of the New York Times. Doesn't get more mainstream than that in American journalism. Theo Baker's mother is Susan Glasser. Susan Glasser has been a longtime writer at The New Yorker. She was at The New Yorker when Jeffrey Goldberg was at The New Yorker. She then was one of the founders of Politico magazine, and she now works for Politico. So Theo Baker's mom and Theo Baker's dad are extremely well entrenched within the highest levels of national American media corporations. That's how you end up being a 19-year-old who gets to write an article for The Atlantic. But it's not just like any 19-year-old, even when your mom and dad are big, important, influential figures in American journalism who are good friends with Jeffrey Goldberg, that would not be enough. What you also need to do in order to get published in The Atlantic is make sure that you are aligned with and willing to serve the political agenda and the most important political causes of the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, Jeffrey Goldberg, which, as I just demonstrated, based on his biography, based on his advocacy, certainly at the top of that list is advocacy of and support for the foreign country of Israel. And one of the main purposes of this article, written by this 19-year-old son of, a, of two very prominent American journalists, was to basically tattle on his classmates, who he came to learn have political opinions that in all likelihood would reflect poorly on them, certainly in certain sectors of American political life as they get older. And he decided to use his platform for the Atlanta, in the Atlantic not to expose the secrets or report on corruption inside powerful institutions, but instead to basically tattle on his classmates and forever pin political views that obviously are inflammatory and you could even say are intemperate to their name by ensuring that they got recorded in the Atlantic, not because those people chose to go write their opinions in the Atlantic, but because Theo Baker decided to quote them saying certain things that he knew would probably be very harmful to their political career, certainly in the circles in which Theo Baker's parents and Jeffrey Goldberg circulate, namely the American mainstream media. So here is how this article began that was published in The Atlantic. Quote, one of the section leaders from my computer science class, Hamza L. Bodali, believes that President Joe Biden should be killed. Quote, I'm not calling for a civilian to do it, but I think a military should. The 23-year-old Stanford University student told a small group of protesters last month, quote, I'd be happy if Biden was dead. He thinks that Stanford is complicit in what he calls the genocide of Palestinians and that Biden is not only complicit but responsible for it. Quote, I'm not calling for a vigilante to do it, he later clarified. But, quote, I'm saying he is guilty of mass murder and should be treated in the same way that a terrorist with darker skin would be. And we all know terrorists with darker skin are typically bombed and drone strike by American airplanes. al Baduli has also said that he believes that Hamas's October 7th attack was a justifiable act of resistance and that he would actually prefer Hamas rule America in place of its current government, though he clarified 
Later that he, quote, doesn't mean Hamas is perfect, end quote. When you ask him what his cause is, he answers peace. Two days after the deadliest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust, Stanford released Milquito's statements making, quote, the moment of intense emotion, marking the moment of intense emotion and declaring, quote, deep concern over, quote, the crisis in Israel and Palestine. So this article began with a very in-depth explanation of the political views of somebody named Hamza El Boudali. He is not a member of Congress. He is not in Joe Biden's cabinet. He's not an official in a major American corporation. He's not an official in the U.S. security state. He doesn't wield any identifiable political or journalistic or economic power the way Theo Baker does, given who his parents are and the access that he has to the Atlantic. He's just a random 23-year-old student at Stanford who has political views that Jeffrey Goldberg and apparently Theo Baker and I'm sure his parents find offensive. And for whatever reason, they decided that the Atlantic's vast resources owned by Lorreen Powell Jobs should be used to expose this 23-year-old student to public scrutiny and public attack because of his political views. Now, this is not a case where... Hamzi al Baduli is committing a crime. He's not actually planning to kill Joe Biden. He's not calling, as he said, on anyone to go and kill Joe Biden. He's engaging in the sort of philosophical inquiry that, at least when I went to college, and I would bet when everybody went to college and when everybody was this age, was the kind of very common philosophizing you do. Namely, well, if we think that it's justified to kill the leader of a terrorist organization, or we think it's justified to kill Saddam Hussein. If we really believe, as many Americans have been arguing, that Joe Biden is the president of the country arming and funding and financing and empowering a genocide, then wouldn't it mean that Joe Biden is a legitimate military target? Now, you don't have to agree with that. You don't even have to think that that's a legitimate political view, but it's the sort of dorm room philosophizing that's extremely common that takes place on political campuses all over the place. If we can kill, if it's legitimate for the American military to kill Saddam Hussein, why isn't it legitimate for the Palestinians to kill Joe Biden? After all, Joe Biden is the one providing the bombs to be dropped on, on Palestine. Why wouldn't Joe Biden be? This is the sort of thing that college students talk about all the time. And there are Thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of college students all over the United States, polls show this, that believe that Israel is engaged in a genocide and that vehemently oppose what Israel is doing in Gaza. In fact, there was just a poll out that a majority of Americans, 75% of Democrats, something like 60% of independents, 30% of Republicans, oppose the Israeli war in Gaza. These are not views that are wildly out of the mainstream, the view that what Israel is doing in Gaza is genocide. There's a formal judicial proceeding pending before the world court brought by the country of South Africa and supported by other governments around the world, accusing Israel formally of committing genocide. Why remotely is it of journalistic value to use the pages of the Atlantic to try and find the single most inflammatory statement some random 23-year-old student at Stanford said, and I say 23, not because he's a child, he's an adult. He's absolutely an adult. He's just an adult who nobody outside of maybe 100 people had heard of until The Atlantic decided to use its pages, which they turned over to a 19-year-old child and I just am avoiding the word son just because of this gender issue. I don't want to misgender the person, but the uh, child of two prominent American journalists who obviously is able to access the Atlantic for that reason. Now, in defense of Theo Baker, they are somebody who has a history of having done college journalism that was commendable. Here, the Washington Post profiled Theo Baker last year, meet the student who helped boot the president of Stanford College journalist Theo Baker's reporting 
paved the way for Mark Tessier Levine's resignation, and it talked about the work they did at Stanford University. But obviously, even that, the fact that you get a profile in the Washington Post, that you get access to the Atlantic, has a is a obviously very related to who his parents are. But the fact is that the main reason is because it aligns with the Atlantic's political agenda of defending Israel and then wanting to vilify people who are critics of Israel, trying to ruin this college student's reputation and his future career prospects by taking statements that he made among friends at a protest and trumpeting it to the entire country in the first paragraph of a major article in The Atlantic. This is what I mean by telltale journalism, an inversion of the kind of journalistic values that we previously had. Here in February of 2021, when I was at Substack, I wrote an article featuring Tel Lorenz and others of her type who typically take the resources of major American media outlets and turn that journalistic lens not on powerful institutions, but just on random individuals. And the headline of that article was the journalistic tattletale and censorship industry suffers several well-deserved blows. And I talked about how often journalism was now being used as a weapon or, or mechanism of punishment, not to attack powerful institutions, but to attack ordinary citizens who are their critics. In 2019, somebody had posted an ordinary, uh, an ordinary citizen had posted anonymously a meme that made fun of Nancy Pelosi, depicted Nancy Pelosi as inebriated, and the Daily Beast went and found out this person's identity and published their name. It was like a truck driver. Punished this person for the crime of having published a meme of Nancy Pelosi that a lot of liberals judged to be excessively mean or whatever. And Columbia Journalism Review published an article, Should the Daily Beast Have Exposed the Man Behind the Quote Drunk Pelosi Video? It like kind of altered a video to make Nancy Pelosi look very drunk. And Columbia Journalism Review said the following, quote, a story by the Daily Beast, Kevin Paulson, reported the original, the, the original uploader is a 34-year-old day laborer a, quote, Donald Trump superfan and occasional sports blogger from the Bronx named Sean Brooks. The story described Brooks as a, quote, proud member of Trump's razor-thin African-American support base and mentioned that he is on probation for a domestic battery charge against his ex-girlfriend and that some of his Instagram posts appear to be misogynistic. So the Daily Beast used its journalistic resources to drag into the light an anonymous citizen who was a day laborer, a black day laborer who supported Donald Trump to punish him for the crime of having made fun of Nancy Pelosi. That's journalism, not holding powerful institutions to account, but serving powerful institutions by going after their critics. And that's exactly what The Atlantic did here. The position of the American government is to support the Israeli government and its war in Gaza. It's a policy supported by both political parties. Supporting Israel has been bipartisan, overwhelming consensus in Washington for decades. That's the reason Israel has received more aid by far than any other country and the reason Joe Biden continues to finance and arm Israel's war with very little opposition in Washington. And so the Atlantic decided to use it's massive resources provided by a billionaire not to investigate the Pentagon or the war machine or anybody else with any power, but to try and destroy the reputation of random students who just had the misfortune of going to school with the child of two extremely influential and powerful American journalists who therefore got access to the Atlantic to vent their frustration and anger at their fellow college students for criticizing Israel in a way they regard as intemperate. This is the sort of journalistic mindset that has become extremely common. It is there to serve establishment dogma, never to investigate or rarely to investigate truly powerful institutions or to expose their wrongdoing or divulge their secrets, but instead to act as their bulldogs and to attack ordinary citizens of the public for the crime of dissenting from 
or criticizing in excessive ways or intemperate ways the most powerful people in the country, and in this case, the people who are responsible for U.S. financing of and arming of the Israeli war in Gaza. And that is the mission of corporate media. They destroy people's reputations, they censor dissent, and they exist to serve the most powerful actors in society. The traditional uh, ethos of American journalism was supposed to be afflict the powerful and comfort the powerless. And as you see over and over, those values have been completely inverted. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.